This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We have got two massive Game 5s coming up tonight. we got the 76ers and the Celtics, the Suns and the Nuggets, both tied at two games apiece. We're going to break down both of those Game 5s with Brandon Gandula and pick his brain on this week's AT&T, Byron Nelson. Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire, joined here as mentioned by Brandon Gandula. Check him out on Twitter. At Gadula13, you can find his work over at numberfire.com. Brandon, two big games coming up tonight. How are you doing today? I'm good. Uh, yeah, game five is always fun. Uh, for this one tonight, we got, you know, the we'll figure out who takes the edge here. Usually it's the home teams, but never know. That's why we tune in. Uh, and I'm excited uh, that, frankly, the, the Lakers won. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's definitely not because of deep-seated um, dislike towards any certain players in the Warriors or anything like that. I'm sure, you know, just a genuine, you're happy for them. You're you're happy for their success. I am happy for the fact that I recommended the money line, mm-hmm. uh, the fact that uh, LeBron James still doing his thing, which I think does not get enough credit. Uh, but I think we're going to get some good games tonight. Um, and... Wyndham Clark. Oh, yeah. Um, kind of having me in a good mood. So I'm just a little more optimistic about everything. So you mentioned him as a first round leader here on the podcast, but for your golf digest picks, he was your win bet, correct? This week? Yeah. I thought I also thought I had him as a sprinkle on the show, which sprinkle I know doesn't as, get... as a first round leader, 85 to one. He was. Yeah. Mm, At least that's what note... I wrote it down as. Okay. My notes, all... it doesn't matter. Hopefully, I might have written it down wrong, but ho- hopefully, uh, People took advantage and, you know, it is what it is. I have a golf contest that I do. It's kind of like one and done, except it's not one and it's not done. Um, You get to use, you get limited uses per golfer. And I had Wyndham as my alternate um, in case one of, uh, I think it was Rory Cantlay or someone else had withdrawn before the event and uh, should have had him in there originally. Did sub him in for the fourth round. Don't get as much money for a fourth round sub, but you know, we'll, we'll take it either way. Uh, but wish he had done that a couple weeks ago. Would have made me a lot mm-hmm. happier, but still happy for Wyndham Clark uh, for the win. Scotty Scheffler, the big favorite for this week at the AT&T Byron Nelson. As mentioned, we'll talk about that later on today as well. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget, if you want a video version, you can check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page as well. Hit the thumbs up button there. Hit subscribe on the FanDuel YouTube page or subscribe on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. And leave us a five-star rating if you like what you hear. The NBA playoffs are in full swing. You can get on the action right now over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Right now, all customers get a no-sweat same-game parlay every weekend when you bet the NBA playoffs. That's right. Just place a three-plus leg same-game parlay or same-game parlay plus on any NBA playoff game. And you'll get bonus bets back if you don't win. There's no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sportsbook. Head to the FanDuel app and get a no-sweat same-game parlay every weekend of the NBA playoffs. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with the Kansas Star Casino LLC. Bonus issued is non withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. Massachusetts Hope is here. GamblingHelplineMA.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-N-Y or text hope y In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 533-42. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700, or in Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. And in West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. 
Let's dig in now to these two game fives for tonight in the NBA. Starting things off in Boston with the Celtics and the 76ers, where we have the Celtics as seven and a half point favorites. Total here is 213. The 76ers, Brandon, did hang on in on Sunday to get that win in OT. It is even up now two games apiece. So with the series now back in Boston, how do you see things playing out here in game five? Yeah, the fact that it's back in Boston is definitely uh, something that we need to note. As we all know, home court advantage is a thing. It's always especially ramped up in the playoffs. But Joel Embiid uh, is listed as questionable, but I mean, he's I mean, almost certainly going to play here. Uh, and you mentioned that comeback uh, bid from the Celtics in game four, 76ers holding them off. And frankly, what is a game based on the underlying data, despite like the point gap and the comeback that the Celtics should have won around 70% of the time. So that's definitely telling um, they have the better, you know, you know, I guess overall, like the series is pretty Pretty even statistically, if you look again at the four factors, which I, I tend to look at a lot as these series progress because so reactionary sort of game to game. And then the, you know, the four factors help us figure out uh, what is actually going on underneath the surface. But the clear gap, like the, 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 the three other four factors, so, I mean, I should probably say what the four factors are, effective field goal percentage, which just accounts for the fact that three-point shots are worth more than two-point shots, turnover rate, offensive rebounding rate and free throws uh, made per field goal attempt. So basically the ways that your offensive possessions can end. So it's really helpful to figure out how teams are scoring, what they're doing, what they're doing well, what they're doing better than most teams. But so the turnover rate, offensive, offensive rebounding rate and free throw numbers um, pretty similar. The big gap here for Boston is an effective field goal percentage. They are leading this round in effective field goal percentage at 58.1 percent uh, that leads the entire uh, playoff round by full a full 3.8 percentage points the 76ers are sixth out of the eight teams in effective field goal percentage um, and boston also then leads pretty easily this round in offensive rating so that's like the main gap despite the fact that this is a 2-2 series a lot of the underlying data says that it should not be should be 3-1 basically uh, by this point and since 2016, if you remove the bubble year, home teams entering game five tied 2-2 uh, have won 72.5% of the time, covered almost 57.5% uh, uh, of the time. But if you look only at the teams in these situations that are actually favored, which you know Boston is, uh, those squads have a 75% win rate, covered 58.3% uh, of the time. Now, I think the spread here is pretty accurate. Um, so that's tough. But... I'm fine uh, with the money line at minus 300 for Boston. I think that's the right play. I don't really see how they uh, lose. It's been taken a lot of heroics from, you know, James Harden, uh, Philly. I mean, to me, not getting a whole lot of help from the rest of their squad aside from the studs. So uh, you, that sort of gets uh, magnified on the road for the most part. And the role players play better at home. Uh, typically. So everything's kind of in line for the Celtics to take control of the series. The data says that they should have, you know, they should basically be in a closeout situation tonight uh, by this point. So that's my main play. And if I had to pick anything else and I, I, I don't mind this, but I'm probably not going to yeah. get there myself. Um, the Celtics team over uh, is one ten and a half. That's minus one ten on FanDuel Sportsbook. I think they can put up points in this game. Uh, and yeah, I think that they might be able to pull away. Uh, down the stretch it's always tough with these playoff games because everything feels tight and slower paced and the the spreads are really like efficient and it's hard to find like big gaps because everything's you know just again magnified but there's also such big blowout potential that i think we might actually see one of those tonight where uh, the celtics do roll despite that i'm not comfortable with the spread sure so i'm just going uh, with the celtics money line first and foremost here the implied odds at minus 300 are 75%. Uh, so 75% implied odds. The Celtics win this game. How I'm much of that is based on? 79.3% for me. So Yeah, so a bit above that. Four percentage points of value at this point in the season is pretty good. Um, so that, that is definitely an edge there. And that is based on your numbers. I think if you're like watching this game, you know, and B didn't look like himself yet, um, especially down the stretch in that game. So the, I think that you add on 
a little bit of like eye test anecdotal stuff on top of what your numbers say, I feel like that should make you feel a bit better about it, even than where you're at. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's just like James Harden's doing a lot of, of heavy lifting and he's capable of doing that. But I mean, they almost didn't win this game. Like in, in game four, they almost didn't win that, which would have been a comeback loss. So you say, well, you know, they probably shouldn't have let it get to that point anyway, but Frankly, the the underlying data uh, for for this this series this this game, just it it's kind it's still kind of close, but but frankly, like the shooting gap is going to be hard to maintain unless they can slow down Boston's offense and find ways uh, to shoot better. Um, there's just not a lot of turnovers necessarily, especially in like that game four. And so we saw a ton of points, and it feels like you know it's just going to be like a high scoring game. I don't really I think it's going to scale back a bit. Sure. Um, in this one, just because I, th- I think each team had like an offensive rating over 125 uh, for game four alone. So that's probably not going to happen again. And for that reason, uh, the more balanced scoring uh, from Boston, I think we're going to see uh, Boston get out here kind of early. This one might feel like it's a little bit out of hand by halftime. I could be wrong, but I do think that Boston wins for a lot of different reasons. Okay, so Brandon likes the Celtics money line at minus 300 and the team total potentially at uh, 110.5 as well. You talked a lot there about home court. Home court is some big here for the Suns and the Nuggets. So far, the home team is 4-0 in this series. Now the series shifts back to Denver, where the Nuggets are 5.5-point favorites. Total here, 227.5. Nikola Jokic will be able to play here despite the confrontation in game number four. How do you see things playing out here with the series shifting back to Denver? Yeah, the Jokic uh, avoiding suspension is absolutely crucial because the Nuggets are basically one of, if not the best teams in basketball with Jokic active, and one of the worst uh, without him. And, you know, it's true that the Nuggets are sweeping the four factors, but it's, it's pretty close throughout all of them. Uh, the effective field goal percentage for Denver, 54.3% for Phoenix, 54.2%. Not a whole lot of turnovers here either. Um, I, I heard, I think on the broadcast that the Suns were able to Increase the pace with Chris Paul sidelined. Um, hasn't, I mean, we kind of see it, but it not. it's not like super relevant or sticky. So I'm not like adjusting for that. But uh, I have the spread at 5.2. I don't think that's enough for me to want to get to either side. It would actually be a slight lean toward the Suns, if anything, but I'm not really there. What I like most is the, the total in this game. Combined, these teams are averaging 226. Uh, points per game have really good offensive ratings. They're both top three behind only the Celtics in this round. But again, going back to those four factors, looking at how these teams are actually playing, uh, I see an average of 223 expected points uh, for uh, this game or for for this series. You know, if you look at the pace, it's like it's a it's it's a solid. Uh, output but it's not like super fast it's not super slow we've seen this game or sorry this series sort of ebb and flow a little bit i don't want to say drastically but noticeably with the pace on a on a per game basis uh i think the offensive ratings were just unsustainable in game four and for that reason i, I think we're seeing uh you know i guess this is still a pretty typical total for this series but uh for me it's the under is where we're at. Denver likes to slow things down at, at home. I mean, they're, they're pretty slow anyway, but 23rd at home pace on the season. Um, for me, the under is the best play in this game. At under, as you mentioned, 227 and a half. Uh, that was, I believe, 228 yesterday. So there has been some movement towards the under in this game um, and is minus 106 on the under right now. When you get situations where you hear on the broadcast about the pace without Chris Paul and it doesn't match up with the data, are you, do you worry about that at all or are you okay ignoring it and trusting that it's more so anecdotal and you can kind of just trust what the data is saying? Cause we have large samples on them without Chris Paul, I think. So it's not like uh yeah, you're not I, like you're making stuff up out of thin air. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's one of those situations too, where like pace and we see this with the NFL too. Mm-hmm. Like there's only, there's only such a, a range of pace that we can get because there's a play clock in the NFL. There's a shot clock in the NBA. There's like a floor 
baked in to every game of, of, of possessions per game. But we're also not going to see teams just completely lift the lid and go seven seconds or less right. uh, in the playoffs and just start chucking it. So it's while we need to know what the, the pace expectations are, they're still relatively reasonable with or without Chris Paul, even if you try to adjust for um, the intent to play a little more up-tempo. Uh, for me, these teams are uh, kind of destined for an under after the offensive uh, output that they had in game four. It's not as simple as, you know, <laughs> they went over in game four, they're going to go under in game five. There's more to it than that. But uh, for me, there's a lot pointing to uh, the under in this game. And I think that another thing that we can kind of figure out, or sorry, look at to figure out is just because one team wants to play fast, it does not mean that the other team does play fast teams tend to play more or less at their own pace. They're not mm. that influenced. I think that's a, an easy misnomer that we can kind of uh, inject into our uh, estimations. Pace, you know, is, is a tricky thing. And even in a, a series of a full seven games, you can see pace waver by about 10 possessions per, per 48 minutes uh, in the same series. So it's hard to pin down. You know, single game shooting efficiency, single game offensive rating, hard to pin down. But if we look at these larger samples, uh, I'm confident to say that the right, the smarter play is the under in this game. Okay, so the two bets that Brandon likes here in the NBA are the Suns Nuggets under 227.5 at minus 106 and the Celtics money line at minus 300. Let's shift folks now and talk about the PGA. It is the AT&T Byron Nelson for this week at TPC Craig Ranch. We've got just two years of data at this course, Brandon. So before we talk about the field, what can we learn about this course from the two years that it's hosted thus far? Yep, uh, par 71, wider fairways, larger greens. Winning scores have been 25 and 26 under par, both won by Kyung Hoon Lee or KH Lee, depending on you know where you see it, same, same person. Um, or Kyung Hoon Lee with no, no hyphen. Um, it's true. I got that one today. That was new. Sometimes there there's a rare like K space H mm. Lee or like just KH with no periods. Yeah. It's Add tough, to it. but Let's keep going, you know. But I don't want to. I don't want to disparage Cage Lee because uh, I he like rules. him. And yeah. <laughs> so he's not. For some reason, I won't classify him as a spreadsheet ruiner. So no, uh, he's a spreadsheet and richer. Yeah, that works. Uh, cut lines have been at least five under par uh, here. So basically, what I'm getting at is you got to score. Now, how do you score? Well, the driving itself is a bit downplayed, which is always interesting because that means that you know. Like, let's be real. There's just there's a subset of pro golfers who are not going to win whenever you have to bomb it off the tee. It's not the case this week. Uh, scores with scores going low, that means that it's easier, which means that, for example, there is basically one superstar in the field this week, only one guy in the top 15. That's Scotty Scheffler. Um, his advantage to score on, say, a tough par four and make birdie while everyone else is making par or bogey or, you know, to make par and everyone else making bogey, that kind of thing that gets mitigated. If everything is scorable, because these guys are all really good. It's, just, it's when things get tough that the best players can separate because their games have no holes and they tend to have distance off the tee. So uh, that's going to minimize the gap for Scheffler on the field, which we'll get to in a second in terms of the value. But uh it's i don't want to say it's just a, a putting contest because there is a bit more that goes into it um but when scores are 25 under par to win you have to be putting well and yes you have to get birdie chances but it's not as hard to get birdie chances even if you're not the best off the tee or you have phenomenal iron play because the greens are larger so it's a pretty big shift from what we saw last week with a designated field a tougher setup this week, it's going to be a little bit more wide open. And while Scheffler is a heavy, heavy favorite, he's the, again, he's the only golfer in the top 15 in the field in the official World Golf Rankings now that Jordan Spieth withdrew. But uh, he's a fascinating case this week. So let's talk about Scheffler. Right now, he is plus 350 at FanDuel Sportsbook. He opened at plus 450, then shortened to 4-1. to one. Before Spieth withdrew, that may have been someone getting advance notice on Spieth potentially, but um, you get it when you look at Scheffler compared to this field. So you mentioned that there are more golfers who can compete here because it's a bit of a birdie fest. 
Does that mean that Scheffler is not a value here at plus 350? That's such a sick question, though. <laughs> um, no, he's no longer a value at plus 350 for me. Okay. I have his win odds at 21.7%, which is basically plus 361. So I had seen value on him at five to one. I think he went to four and a half to one. And then I, I went to bed and now he's three and a half to one. So look, if you want to bet Scotty Scheffler, I don't think it's super egregious. Um, that's like a rounding error in, in how things go uh, with, with modeling something like this many times could run it again and he could be a slight value. So like, yeah. ju- it just sort of is what it is. Um, people hate, seem to hate when, <laughs> heavy favorites are values uh, anyone basically shorter than 10 to 1 people think that they're automatically bad plays and that's just not how it works and uh, yet they bet them you look at like betting splits on like <laughs> different stuff and the highest handle is always on or the the highest ticket count is always on scotty scheffler or whatever it may be yeah they complain, I mean, but a, they still bet it <laughs> there's a there's a reason that he's right at shorter odds than he has been correct <laughs> so i mean why is that <laughs> And like, yeah, it's cool. It's it's hip. It's fun to to get the long shots. It's mm-hmm. like when you get the Wyndham Clark, it's phenomenal. But it's not just a matter of the favorites always being overvalued. In my model, he is close to a value. I'm not going to bet him, but I wouldn't really argue with anyone who who wants to. So. But frankly, if I'm not betting Scheffler, there's not a whole lot else I like this week. It's kind of tough. Let's say hypothetically someone is out there and has access to a four to one. Would you take that? Is that long enough, big enough value? You're at 21.7. You said that'd be 20% implied. Is that big enough for you? Yeah, that'd be good. Okay. So you can find a Scheffler four to one or if he lengthens, you know, Wednesday sometime. We do sometimes see golfers lengthen overnight Tuesday to Wednesday if they're not getting enough action there. So if he does lengthen to four to one, that'd be a spot to fire on Scheffler there. What about other outrights? If Scheffler is sucking up 21.7% of the win equity, it may be tough to find value elsewhere. So any other outrights you like this week, Brandon? Yeah, so I have this all on my spreadsheet, but I'm going to pull this up and get a better view of it because I haven't really looked at like the, the top down. Mm-hmm. So we have Tiro Hatton at 13 to one, Jason Day 17, Tom Kim 17, Hideki Matsuyama and KH Lee are 24, and that, that's that's it. So we get six golfers shorter than 32 to 1. Uh-huh. Um, now, that's not influencing my picks. I just I haven't really looked at the board like that yet, so I was just curious to see where things were because I'm not finding a lot of value in the spreadsheet. But yeah. the one name that does pop and the one name that I feel really good with is Jason Day at 17 to 1. Uh, he is third in the field in strokes gain T to green over the past 50 rounds, according to data golf, which does adjust for field strength. He's third in putting as well. That's, that's pretty phenomenal. And even if you're not like modeling things out and you see someone top three in both of those, probably not the worst bet. Um, but you know, for me, he is, he is actually one of the best, uh, betting values of the week, if not the best, um, missed the cut in T 51 at the Byron Nelson at TPC Craig ranch, which I think might scare some people off, although his odds have shortened since yesterday, although I had numbers with Spieth, so I don't really know where he was. Um, but he's going through a resurgence right now, coming off a missed cut too. So I, th- I think that this number sh- could even be shorter if he uh, had a, l- a better super recent form, better course form. Right now, Jason Day 17-1 to 1 is the best bet of the week for me and for my model, and I feel good, and I, I, I like that number. Uh, the, once you get past 15 to one, I feel like I can actually enjoy betting. <laughs> Sometimes if it's like 12 to one, I'm like, I see value, but I don't love it. But yeah, just cause the, the, I mean, one of the funnest parts of golf betting is getting access to these bigger numbers and these bigger returns. 17 to one for Jason day, I think makes sense, uh, in every way imaginable. So with Day, do you think that the fact that he has a long injury history and has like a couple events where he's been a bit spotty, is that why people may be hesitant to bet him given that 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 track record or what do you think is keeping him from being shorter than 17 to one here? Well, I mean, he is moving down. Um, Where did I have him? Um, I have before Spieth withdrew. Uh, He was 21. 
Yeah. So, so I mean, he's he is one then. I mean, he is moving down. Yeah. Um, don't know how much of that exactly is with just a, a result of speed, but right. Look, if, if Scheffler's getting bet down, then clearly uh, he, it's it's a matter of like people looking at Scotty Scheffler, um, Cheryl Hatton coming off a good week. Uh, Cage Lee, two time winner, he's probably getting some some action there. So it it's probably just a, a matter of like Jason Day. Let me see exactly. Let's pull up Day here. So I know he he missed the cut at at the Wells Fargo, um, T thirty nine at the Masters. So he hasn't basically had a a top like a great result since March. So. Mm-hmm. Here's like a perfect example of why I like my model, even if yeah. sometimes I don't 100% agree with it or bet exactly what it's telling me to or only bet, you know, you know, Jason Day is golfing a lot better or noticeably better than a 17 to one number, even if he's been not at the forefront of our minds. And the what the model does is say, like, this is how good this guy's been. And here's per, here's where he should be for this week based on like the course adjustments that I used to. So like, it's a I think it's a it's a matter of if we were back in March and he was top tenning everything, yeah, he would be twelve to one in this field, yeah, for sure. If not shorter, uh, yeah, yeah. So if you can get Scheffler four to one or longer, take that. If not, Jason Day seventeen to one, a good value by Brandon's numbers. What about the non outrights? Uh, anything else catching your eye there? Well, I do have two two more guys I'd consider for outrights because I do see value. Um, Taylor Montgomery at forty six, and our guy Tom Hoagie oh, at fifty buddy. to one. Oh, buddy, we're in. Let's basically go. basically the inverses of iron play. Montgomery, pretty rough iron play, but this is not the course where you need to be extremely precise with your irons. Now that's always tricky because you need to go low, and so you gonna have a hard time making birdies if your irons are bad but these are larger greens driving is not super important and his short game is really good if this does turn into a, like a pure cutting uh, uh putting contest montgomery just one of the best in the world right now with the putter hoagie uh second in the field in irons uh 24th in putting over the past 50 rounds hasn't played since the zurich but um you know his, his putter gets hot so if, I, if i'm realistically not going to get the scheffler and I, I like jason day I can also throw in Montgomery and Hoagie um, and feel good with those potential returns because I do see value on them. And they are long enough too, where you can still be happy if you have, let's say you have Scheffler even let's say, let's say you take Scheffler, yeah. you have Scheffler four to one with Montgomery and Hoagie. If Scheffler wins, you're still feeling good about that. And you're still having a profitable week. You're not overexposing yourself to one market where only one person can win. So even if it is, down to being Scheffler, adding those two guys, Montgomery at 46 and Hoagie at 50, those probably make sense. So what about the non-outrights? Are Hoagie and Montgomery popping for you there or focusing more so on other guys? They are for top 10s as well. And basically anytime I bet a, a what I would call a long shot, once you get outside like the 40 to 1 range, I, I feel like it's um, a long shot. And I don't always just bet them for top 10s. I have to make sure the number's right. I do, I do think the number's right for both of them. Uh, for top tens, but other options uh, in the top ten market, um, Tom Kim is plus two ten. Uh, he does not need to be long off the tee this week. He's fourth in in uh, strokes gained tee to green among the field over the past fifty rounds. Adam Hadwin to top ten is much more of a fun top ten at, at uh, plus five hundred. Short hitter, but accurate and a great putter. Twenty uh, ninth in ball striking, fifteenth in combined short game over the past. 50 rounds and then a top 20 i like dylan Wu plus 410 consecutive top 25s uh he's really had the irons and putting working well for him and those are the two stats where you can gain the most strokes so a uh, good profile to top 20 for dylan Wu at plus 410 so Dylan Wu plus four ten for a top twenty. Adam Hadwin plus five hundred for a top ten. Tom Kim plus two ten for a top ten. If you want a Montgomery and Hoagie, Brandon said he did like those as well. Montgomery is plus four ten for a top ten. Hoagie plus four fifty for a top ten for this week. Any final thoughts for you, Brandon, before we close up shop here for uh, a fun NBA Tuesday and uh, for the AT and T Byron Nelson? Uh, yeah, probably, maybe that sounds like too many top 10s uh, to get after. But the thing is, the top 10 market, at least in my experience, is there's value on like four or five names and then everyone else is a 
Agreed not a good value. A value. <laughs> so like that kind of balances out. So, uh, but you know, it's never, uh, I always like to give us some options too. Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, it's going to be a good week for uh, some guys who uh, look, I, I think Sheffer makes a lot of sense, but I think we're going to see some other names in the mix uh, for this week. And that's always fun. All righty. Well, that is all that we have here for today on Covering the Spread. Brandon, want to thank you, as always, for hanging by, breaking down your thoughts on NBA and PGA. Good luck to you this week. Go hit a Wyndham Clark winner again, despite I don't think he's in the field. Uh, but go. go. Uh, we're crossing our fingers once again. And good luck to you tonight in the NBA, too. Thank you. Thank you. Find Brandon on Twitter at Cadula13 and find his work over at numberfire.com. I am on Twitter at Jim Sanas, J I M S A N N E S. Do not forget to subscribe to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. We'll talk to you all once again tomorrow. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs> 